You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. Each week, you'll hear from remarkable guests who have overcome challenges and obstacles to succeed in the face of adversity. By listening to their stories, you'll get practical tips, tools, and resources you can implement today to bust through your own internalized prisons of worry and doubt. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, this is Sarah, and welcome back to another episode of the No Labels No Limits podcast. We are doing another five-year celebration compilation. This week, we are sharing clips from four interviews from March, um, and we're going to hear from Christina Milosevic, who is an experienced marketing manager, project manager, and consultant, business and marketing coach, and she's an English teacher. Um, She assists small business owners with their online presence by creating their websites, landing pages, and branding um, strategies. But in this interview, we're going to talk to Christina about meditation, how that sets her day off and then really how she is able to help folks get centered on community and connect with their own community. Then we're going to hear from Lisbeth Wesley Casella. Now, Lisbeth is a seasoned CEO, entrepreneur, and business consultant. She's got more than two decades of experience in specialized internal communications training, executive virtual assistance, and online business management. Um, I've selected this clip because Lisbeth shares her very personal journey from bulimia and anorexia to management leadership, and it's a journey of body diversity and emotional liberation. Then we're going to hear from Pat Alva Cracker, who had a long and successful 35-year career in the IT industry. She had a great marriage and partnership of 22 years and a successful 200-acre ranch until she was confronted with a series of challenges that altered her life forever, and and I honestly have to say would have altered mine as well. And we talk about that in this episode, and particularly I asked Pat to share how she was able to detach from the past and build a wealthy and full new future that lifts herself and other women up. It's pretty inspirational. And then we round out this celebration compilation with an episode with Jana Jopko. I wished I could have told you or shared with you the entire episode because it's worth listening to Jana's laugh, or Yana is actually how she pronounces her name. And in this episode, I ask her some of her tips and step-by-step guide to healing body, mind, and spirit. So take a listen. I hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, please share it with a friend. Uh, Make sure to rate and review the episodes. And then also let us know who you'd like to hear from on the podcast and we'll see what we can do to make that a reality for you. Okay, with that, let's dive into this week's episode. You are part of a group of my, I think you're like my 173rd guest on the podcast. And I like to start by asking every single person if there is something they do every day that keeps them focused on reaching their ultimate goal. So is there something you do? Yeah, what I do is to do meditation in the morning, get my coffee and prepare plan for daily uh, daily to do list what what I need to do you know and that's like every single day and you know that is like weekly and monthly and to the end of the month I can see results of my um, special things which I do in the morning when I get up so when you do your list is that tied to longer term this is just me getting into the weeds with you a little bit but you, do you do your list and think, okay, these are the things that I have to do today, or do those things on your daily list link to things you're trying to do within the year or the quarter? Are they like tagged to a bigger goal? Yeah, uh, uh, they're tagged into small goal, smaller goal, and bigger because which uh, if I don't finish that day, I know that I need to do repetition and every 
uh, all things which I didn't uh, resolve, I, I need to, to get in and put everything in space to, to finish, that I get results. Okay, so you are focused on getting results. Yes, I am, and we need self-discipline and discipline to, to be much more organized and that we can get much more productivity in our business and personal life. Now, have you always been a disciplined person or did you have to create the habits to become more disciplined? Yeah, I, I was very, very disciplined when I was in primary and high school and much more than I'm now, I, I, uh, to be honest. But yes, I, I knew, uh, I um, learned habits and, you know, we need to adapt, to accept new habits and from people who are better than, than us, how I can say. So... So you started off as an economics perfector, professor, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. I graduated economics, but I'm so passionate about languages. And I wanted to, to, to study English language. But, but I, I, do love, I do job which I love to do. So I'm, I speak only in, uh, in French and Italian. And I really uh, achieve what I want to do, just like uh, graduate economics. And I'm English teacher and economics, how, marketing manager. How I, I have two jobs. in my. So in you my can course. do the things you love to do. Yes, and I really enjoy my my business, especially in my freelance team, because I was in corporate job, and when I it was ten years ago, and I started my freelance remote team, and I'm so independent. I, I like to work with people which I work, who I work, want to work. You know, you know that, that that's so amazing. But sometimes, you know, you take your risk every 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 time. You know. You need to, to find clients, to, to speak, to, you know, to handle everything, to manage team, you know, to be a leader in your team. So, so running juggling, your own business. Juggling, is, juggling between teacher and a coach like, as manager. So, yeah. Well, it's, you know, when you're running a business, you're not, you don't just get to do the thing, right? It's a business. Like you're saying, you've got all these other pieces of it. Right. So it does stretch you on that. But I'm curious, um, you know, you you like to work with people internationally. You like languages. What do you enjoy most about connecting both at the local and international level with entrepreneurs and business communities? Uh, I enjoy most when I connect with women, especially women entrepreneurs. And when we have strategic uh, strategy session call. And we know each other and introduce ourselves and know about them, just like knowing about their habits, about the job. And, you know, just we were good friends and I nurturing my friends, online friends. And then that way, it my uh, book just, uh, I, I found a way how to, to be a co-author of the book. Nothing is, you know, that's, that's enjoy to speak with women, to know about them and see how we can help each other, you know. That's, that's, Is there that's something that you've learned over the last, let's just say couple of years, or even just during COVID? Is there something you've learned from speaking with all the women that you're going, you know, I always love talking to women and helping them, but now I've learned X about the folks I work with, or I even appreciate them more because of whatever. Is there something specific that stands out for you? Um, specific is uh, to get much more loved in networking path, you know, to, because as you, I work as a manager and project manager is in this uh, digital and, and so, social media world and everything, but you, you can just start in uh, learn something new in just for your personal life and networking. So, uh, you know, we, we drank a digital coffee, sit down in front of like me and you now, and you, you, you just hear their stories and you can just hear and, and all these stories can help you. If you have some problem, for example, health problem or any, you can just remind us, Hey, this person, she has something like that. Maybe I can just think about it and see how I can resolve my problem. And, 
that is like friendship, you know, and how we can support each other because women are so amazing. And especially when you learn about tradition in US or just my friend, she's from Tasmania originally. And just think about I'm here and my partner in my group, Women Embracing the World, where we are co-creator of the group so in the opposite side of the world so that that's that's amazing that's you 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 get credibility you get everything and th that is no way because of this time now for me it's normal to work online that's, that that's and it. you know i also find that when you network and online is great because it does it drops the walls of how far away from yourself you can network right it's not just in your own town or your own business community and I think I would share with you also that I love being in groups where, you know, it's women, there's men on there too, but people are so giving, you know, they're just like, oh, you know what, give me a buzz, I can help you with that, or let's chat offline, or I can give you a resource, or do you want just to spend 20 minutes together? Um, but there really is a giving, supportive, um, kind of just undertone, you know, of the group and it's so valuable. So I'm glad that your your folks are getting the benefit of that too. And it doesn't always have to be around business. Sometimes it's like you said, it's just about living. But then you talked about running an initiative for former first lady, Michelle Obama, right? So where did that connect? <laughs> well, um, when I left and decided to start my own business, where I landed um, just happened to be in the eating disorders community. So I started working with the larger national organizations, helping support them in administrative work, in event planning, membership uh, management, and in some of their policy spaces. What, what I brought to the table was more than just, you know, spreadsheet stuff and calendaring. I brought, you know, program development. So when um, we were, I think it was 2013 and, um, the, I'm trying to think, yeah, it was 2013 and the first lady was slated to be on the show, the biggest loser and somebody in the eating disorders community will remember that very vividly because that was a huge problem for us. We saw the biggest loser as a program that celebrated a lot of behavior that contributes to eating disorders and weight stigma. So being a weight stigma prevention advocate and being in the eating disorders realm, I was compelled to really see what we could do to push back on that idea and hopefully get her to cancel her appearance. Long and the short of it is that the community came together. We um, were able to get information to the first lady's office I met with her staff, the Let's Move staff, the day that they were filming her episode. So we didn't end up meeting that end, but we did have a really good conversation about the Let's Move program and unintentional side effects of some of the language that was in there that was stigmatizing. We were finding that, you know, children as young as five and seven were in in treatment eating disorders because they were so afraid of the the idea of fat they didn't understand the concept of body diversity um and the to their credit the team was really invested in making sure that that problem was alleviated so i was able to bring together some people in medical and um uh, mental health and exercise and movement and um eating disorders and and a wide range of um, specialty areas and as a coalition, we came together and we wrote, rewrote some of the languaging and we also put together some implementation guidelines. So not only did the um, program have languaging that softened or clarified some issues, but also people who were implementing the program on the ground had some guidelines about how to engage children in movement and look at food and activity in a way that um, was more healthy to the overall environment and helped with the outcomes that they were trying to, to meet. So you're right back there to your whole bridging communication across communities piece. Yes, and that is really the, the catalyst for what's driven me to build the organization from being a virtual assistance based organization to um, 
the internal communications piece. I no longer support clients in virtual assistants. I have a team that um, I'm, you know, we make matches. We have people who have really long-term uh, contracts with each other. The clients that we have, um, you know, we really love, they love us. It's really great. But we also attract larger corporate business to help them, especially right now, since the transition to remote work wasn't anticipated by most businesses. We're helping them to say, hey, you made it for a year. Congratulations. The wheels are still on the bus. But are you working at the level with the efficiency that you'd expected to be? OK, now is the time that we look at plans and policies and make them work with the environment that you've got and the talent that you've got and maybe even up that so that you're starting to attract, you know, the talent that you dreamt about, because there are people making a lot of changes right now. And. It, it's good to have your, your home in order so that people really want to come and work with you rather than thinking that they're signing on to fix a mess and then get down to the dirty work. That's a great distinction right there. The piece about, um, you know, are you working efficiently? You know, so folks who wanted maybe for a long time to work remote, they believe they could do it. Um, some folks find they're not wired to work remote as well. Like it's like, oh, I'd like to be out of the office and all of that stuff. And then they realize that they need that kind of connection piece. And then there's others who are, see, when are we connecting next? I'm right on it, right? So when you have those different person, and there's a bunch of personalities in between, I'm not saying <laughs> they're not the only two. Those are the two that come to mind for me. Um, but how do you help organizations or where do you start maybe is a better question of linking policy or practice with that organization's true culture so that it's not you're not you know people don't say these are communication policies but they are so out of touch with who that organization is and how they want their people to be i am a firm believer that you can have as many tools as you want but they, tools don't solve, solve the problem. Tools are meant to help you solve a problem, but you can't just turn to a software. Like you can't say, I'm going to implement Monday.com and everybody's going to understand what everybody else is doing and feel great about it. And yay, we're moving forward. It's only as good as what you put into it. So for us, um, where I start is I interview everyone. I do a one-on-one -on -one interview with um, each member of the team. It's confidential. We talk about the things that are working well, the things that aren't working well, broken process, what the ideal day looks like, if they understand their job description, if it aligns with what they're doing. It's, you know, there, there's a survey and a, an interview piece that's really important to get to understand what that baseline is for each person, because every business really is built by the people who work there. It's not just the idea of the founder or the leader's North Star. It's comprised of the people who do the work. And then after that, I uh, wrap that up and I present a report to the, the leadership that's engaged us. Um, and we talk about, okay, where does what's existing, today's state, misalign with what your North Star is or what you'd like the future state to be? And we start to connect the dots and make some suggestions. And this is where my training in lean comes in because I bring representative collaboration from every level of the, the business in for a conversation. It doesn't mean that all 50 people are there, but we have people that represent all the different departments and all the different levels within the organization to come together and say, okay, is everybody clear what the mission is? Yes, we're clear what the mission is. Okay, how are we going about getting there? And you'll have people say, well, you know, they want us to get there by this route that takes a left and a right and a left. But we're, when we do that, we find these problems. It's inefficient. I think we should be going left, right, left. Um, and we have those discussions. And it's always, always, without fail, a really great time. I find that leadership is blown away by the fact that people that they hadn't recognized within their existing talent pool have the solutions already. We just need to talk it through why what's work, what's happening now isn't working, why what the suggestion that we're focusing on may work, 
and what iteration looks like. So we build a plan from there and we test it. We see if it works, we make tweaks. And then once it's in place and working and people are finding their groove, then we start to codify those plans. We memorialize them in handbooks or policies or imagery. Um, and then to a certain degree, there may be some training involved that, you know, I come in and I do a certain department um, training or we, you know, part of the services that we provide um, include a, a platform assessment. So like, are you using too many platforms? Is it Zoom plus WhatsApp plus Teams plus some of those things can be eliminated so that everybody knows where they should be communicating, what types of information and where to find it. So it's really information organization with an eye toward the way that people like to do their jobs. And the way that people like to do their jobs, if they're able to engage in that, that gives them confidence that they understand what success looks like. And when they understand what success looks like, then the creative spark of innovation comes in and they bring solutions or they bring higher standards to leadership. So it really is a way of improving from the ground up. I love it. And I really like hearing that you don't wait, like you don't go through this whole long process and say, here's your policies and procedures, but you actually road test them. Mm -hmm. 100%. You have to engage and, and you have to engage the people who are doing them. Um, if you just have a mandate that comes from the top down, very rarely are you going to find the entirety of your workforce to be compliant. Well, honestly, as small as my organization is, at the end of the day, I want to have a good outcome, right? And I know, so I spent a lot of time outlining this to be super clear, these instructions that I needed one of my VAs to do. He's new. I thought I'm going to give him a break. Instead of being vague, I'll be very specific. So I email it to him. I says, let me know if this is clear, if you want to hop on a call. He said, I think I understand. Think being the wrong word to hear. I wasn't clear enough, right? He goes, could we hop on a call next week? We're in different time zones. I said, sure. He goes, so here's what I'm thinking. Oh, and in my email, I said, please tell me if you have a better way to do this, right? I'm thinking, because honestly, well, because that was my best guess, right? That's how I would approach it, but that's how my brain works, right? And I know I can overcomplicate things. So I do, I can make them really intricate. So anyway, we talk on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, and he's, I says, so what do you think about the approach? He goes, well, let me tell you what I think. And he said, I took it to my team, and we think we could make some recommendations on how to go about it more simply and get you probably better results than what you even anticipate. And, I, and all I thought was, thank you for A, saying you have a better idea and for coming back with it, you know, and, um, because he knows more than I do, right? So like to your point of taking it to the who's going to be doing the work, he knows more than I do about that. And so, and I do that with my other team members who know more than me because I don't know at all as much as I'd like to. And I, and in a big organization and, you know, when I was working in corporation, even though we weren't huge, you're all super busy and in your own world. And if you don't come back and have some time to pilot test, you can assume that a decision or a direction that was made one time actually works. And you can go far down that road and then all of a sudden go, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> we invested all of this money and it's broken. <laughs> well, and then, but then there's that whole, like, I don't want to waste the investment when in fact chucking part of it is the right thing to do, you know? Yeah. So anyway, anyway, rabbit hole. Um, so you started your firm. How long ago did you start your firm? Well, let's see, 12 years ago, I think. Yeah, just about 12 years ago. Um, <laughs> are we still in 2021? <laughs> no, it goes fast. It does. It does. Um, I, you know, I loved the people that I was working with, but I realized at a certain point that I was always going to be the queen of the admins. I was never going to make that leap into, you know, management and leadership and, if I wanted to do that, it meant that I had to go out and do something different. So that's the benefit of not knowing what I didn't know. I wasn't as scared as I probably should have been, but um, I just kind of set my jaw and grabbed my briefcase and poof, off I went. 
Did you um, set yourself up to have like a cushion for a few months or how did you plan for that? <laughs> well, because, you know, did you walk in one day and say, here's my notice, I'm out of here? Well, I said it, you, you know, thank you for having come to my wedding. I love you all very much. I'm going to try <laughs> something different. But yeah, I um, started my business by selling my designer handbags, which bought me one year of a hosted website and an email address and a business license. So That's you had it. a little bit of cushion, nothing to write. With. <laughs> that was it. That was it. I, and then I just started um, going to different. Th this was at the same time that I'd been diagnosed with an eating disorder. So I started going to eating disorders conferences and seeing that they could be run much more either efficiently or professionally or whatever. And I'd say, hey, do you need somebody to volunteer to help me you know, kind of clean this up a little bit? And invariably I'd hear yes. And so I started to get to know those people. And then when they'd see other skill sets came with this volunteer, I eventually started getting clients. So part of it is putting yourself out there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, you talked about having an eating disorder. Had you been tiptoeing up to addressing that for a long time or did you just like, what was your tipping point on that? Because that's a brave thing to, first of all, to share and to address openly because it helps a ton of people. Um, what was your tipping point? Well, it's interesting. Um, it's only in retrospect that I understand that I'd had either disordering, disordered eating behavior or an eating disorder since my late teens. Um, you know, I, in my late teens, it was the late eighties and everybody celebrated the thin body type. So I did whatever it took to maintain that. And then later in life, um, I think I'd kind of, you know, blown my metabolism out and my eating disorder shifted to, uh, take on a different form. And so then I went into a uh, binge eating disorder and high weight anorexia. So I would be in a big body, but I would starve myself like all of the same eating disorder behavior that you have in a thin body but in a larger body so at that point i did not know that there was anything other than bulimia and anorexia so it didn't cross my mind that i had an eating disorder but i knew that i was so ashamed of myself and my body that i didn't want to see people so my husband was going up to visit his family in long island and i feigned illness oh i can't go with you this time i just don't feel good and what i really was is i was ashamed and as he drove off i had my laptop on the bed and i was crying and i'm typing out all of these things related to weight and i just couldn't find the right words and finally i typed binge eating disorder and or binge eating and the binge eating disorder association beta came up and i started looking at the website and reading the stories and i'm like Oh my God, that's me. I, all of that, every single one of those stories or symptoms is me. And then through the website, I was able to find providers that, um, you know, offer therapy. And uh, I started going to see somebody at that point. And so it was by understanding that I had an eating disorder that I then started my, the next stage of my career. It was phenomenal because the two, um, overlapped in a very um, safe space for me. I could work as hard as I wanted and the work that I was doing and the stuff that I was reading to be good at my job was also really informative to help me learn different coping skills and, and to get into recovery. Talk about reinforcing behaviors. <laughs> yeah. You know, what a perfect, perfect alignment of the stars for that, you know, from being in that you know that and feeling that shame and not wanting to go is a it's tough it, it really is and when i finally got to a place where i understood body diversity and i understood that my worth didn't equate to my waist size um it was so freeing and i actually remember the moment and i don't know why it happened then but i was gardening in my front yard and it just hit me. I don't have to be ashamed of myself. And so I sat there and cried among the flowers. <laughs> but it was very liberating. And then I really became fierce about wanting to share that message and wanting people to understand that, you know, 
30 plus million people in America have an eating disorder. So that's like saying, do you know anyone from Illinois? Because Illinois is basically that same population size. If you know someone from Illinois, you probably know somebody with an eating disorder. So when you were working all of those hours and stepping up and having to step in, you know, especially when you had weather that made it prohibitive for your ranch hand to help, were you, did you ever have a thought like, you know what, this is really what I want to do. I don't want to be in a corporate grind. Or did you feel like um, something's out of whack and you need to make adjustments? Or did you just add it in and go, this is a temporary thing I'm going to adjust? Mm -hmm. uh, I did. I did do that. I had to sit back and say, what is it that I that I really want to do? What was I meant to really do? And my passion has, has always been helping women. And I've taken all the lessons from you know running a ranch with my husband to, to help other women in their business. And I knew that there was a time that we would sell this ranch. I knew that there was a time that that would happen. I just never I just never knew when. And when it happened, I was like, okay, what am I supposed to learn from this situation? And what do I really want to do? You know, am I, am I at a point where this particular experience, this chapter now has to come to a close because I'm being asked to step into a different role, a bigger role, a bigger, a role of greater impact. And that's how I, I took it. So I said, I'm going to take care of my animals. I'm going to learn what it takes to sell property and sell this ranch and, and move on. And uh, I kept it for mm, eight years after my husband passed away. And then, you know, began selling the animals, put the property for sale. And there's, there's, there's always a part of me that says, God, I wish I was around those animals because I really, really miss them. And I knew that in order to move forward, that chapter needed to close and I needed to learn how to detach. I needed to learn how to detach from the ranch. I needed to learn how to detach from the pain that I had as, uh, as experiencing the death of my husband in order for me to move on. Because I did that, I was open to another relationship, and I married a second time to an amazing man. And had I not been able to make that shift and close that chapter, I wouldn't have been open to receiving him in his love. Let me ask you, if there are, and I'm thinking about all the people you help, and particularly the women, right, because that's your passion, if there are challenges you notice that we have with detaching so that we can move from a past iteration of ourselves into what's yet to come. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, repeat your question. So are there particular sticking points that we have mm -hmm. when what we need to do is detach? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. How, how do we move through those? Yeah, so what happens is, what I've taught women is, first of all, I, I teach different things when it comes to detachment. And one of those things is to actually write a letter to the person or the situation and be able to, what, to express whatever's going on within their heart in regards to that situation. And let all that sadness or pain or sorrow, whatever that is, it's just to write it out. And at the end say, I now let go. And I ask him to take that letter and in a safe place, burn the letter. So I take him through a ceremony that allows him to detach. I also, when I work with them, I lead them to live a life of intention, which encourages you to live and encourages them to live in the present. So that they have to bring their focus to the present because that's where the power is. When you're still hung up, hung on, you still are hanging on to a situation, you're living your life in the past. It's like getting in the car and driving through the rearview mirror. That doesn't get you anywhere. So I ask them, do you, do you want to move forward? I encourage you to step into the present because that's where all the action and the power is within you 
to moving forward. So I teach them how to use the power of intention, which is one of the practices that I have in my book. And I ask them to lay out mentally, spiritually, and emotionally what it is, what outcome do they want of a specific situation. And then I ask them to detach and just say, this or something better will come to me. So I, I teach them how to practice detachment every day. That's powerful. That's very powerful. So I think I understand from the story you've shared maybe a little bit about what helped you become a wealth builder, strengths coach, and a business strategist, but those are my assumptions. So talk to us about what led you to that direction. You know, uh, I appreciate that question. Um, for me, I've always had the, uh, the, the, uh, the passion to move women forward. And I became, through the experiences with the cancer, through uh, the death of my husband and being laid off, all those added a level of clarity of where I wanted to be. And through that level of clarity, I learned, I began, I began to really step into my life through intention and creating what it is that I want. And then leveraging everything that I was learning, leveraging the profits, leveraging my resources, leveraging my time. And that's what I teach women. So I, I help them incre increase their profits, become more productive as a person, and increase the, the performance of their teams. And then I say, and then I ask them, do you want to leverage the money you just made? Let me tell you, let me share with you three different ways that you can leverage and make more money with your money. Because I went through that process myself. So my second business is that of a real estate private lender. So I fund women who are investors and need money to fund their remodels of the homes that they're buying and reselling. And it's proven to be a very profitable business for me that I can actually teach to other women. So I, as I've learned and leveraged my income, I said, why not teach other women how to leverage their income so they can build wealth, greater sense of wealth, and um, leverage what they know and what they have. So they come in exhausted, burnt out, defeated, um, with strained relationships. People don't understand, and I didn't understand, how our um, burnout affects our relationships. They're overwhelmed. They're in pain. They may be suffering with headaches, migraines. They have One of my clients had acne all over her body, and she was an adult in her 30s. Uh, they have brain fog, poor memory, poor concentration, hormonal problems, mood swings, <laughs> emotional issues, uh, unexplained weight gain, prediabetes, diabetes, poor work performance, because most of the time I deal with working professionals. This is really important. Um, so that's kind of where my clients come in. And I try to educate them on the three causes of disease. So we're dealing with inflammation nutrient deficiencies, and toxicity. So I'm looping it back to that uh, detox drink in the morning that I drink, my charcoal. <laughs> you know, I'm going to um, keep talking to you about that after the podcast too. <laughs> Love it. All right. So then stage one, the health reset. They are thinking to them, okay, I'm ready to take charge of my own healing journey. That's kind of what I talk about but they don't know where to start. So we start with the energy diet. We start adding in anti-inflammatory foods to nourish the body and the brain, because there's a connection here with your gut to your brain. We need to bring the inflammation down so we can think clearer. What are a couple of the foods that you have people start introducing? Actually, one of the good questions, Sarah, one of the most powerful things in nourishing the body and bringing the inflammation down is just something really simple is a healthy green smoothie. And that's 80% vegetables, 20% fruit. Okay. So a little bit less on the sugar and something like berries are amazing with spinach and even a banana, if you need a little bit of sweetness. 
and mix that up in coconut water or something like that. Amazing. If you drink that every day, you will notice a difference. And we actually do that through my 10 day challenge as well. So <laughs> we'll come back to the 10 day challenge. Yes, I make, definitely. I forget. Okay. Okay. So stage two, gut repair. So um, people need to clean up their diet. They may be struggling with gut issues and staying consistent. So we kind of work on that. We, at this point, start removing some of the triggers um, and so that we are able to put the body into a healing mode and uh, start decreasing a lot of the symptoms due to inflammation or toxicity. So these symptoms could be um, inflammation in joints. A lot of times people are have joint problems so they're in pain they have a lot of headaches um, migraines because there's just too much toxicity or they've got a completely um, open gut so food is coming into their body creating pain that way so we take out some of those triggers and everybody's slightly different but there are definitely certain triggers like gluten um, milk uh, it could be different foods one of my clients was I think she had like a list of 10 things that she could eat. That was it. So her diet, the foods that she could eat was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. She was getting more malnourished and not seeing any results, what she was doing on her own. So that, that was interesting one to watch. Um, stage three, we go into mind renew. So now they're starting to feel better, but they're trying to conquer some giants in their lives. And that could be the, I am not worthy. I don't deserve to be well. Well, if you think that way, your body cannot heal because you're thinking, I don't actually deserve it. So you sabotage yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I actually want to tell you, there was an interesting study done um, it was on why the researchers were looking, why do people not, are not able to change their health habits? And any guesses on what they found? Well, I would, we, there'd be a couple of things. I could think of things like creating unnecessary barriers in the path, but also having to change what you're doing and fear of not maybe having disrupting a family or a social group that you're in by your own needs and wants above others. I don't right. know. You got me. Right. Started. Or the foods, right? Right. The, the, you think, oh, it's the bucket of ice cream or it's the chip and Coke. But they were shocked to find out that the number one reason that people do not make the transition into or cannot make the transition into a healthy lifestyle is because they don't feel worthy of it. And so from day one, when they come into Yana's world, and this happens in the challenge as well, <laughs> I want to practice something with you and your audience. So I want you to take your right hand and put it on your heart. I want you to take a deep breath and repeat after me. Okay. I'm with you. I deserve this healing journey. I deserve this healing journey. I deserve to be well. I deserve to be well. And I deserve to be whole. And I deserve to be whole. How did that feel? It feels righteous. It feels good. <laughs> right. I've had, I've had students that actually cry just because of that, because they had a shift in their mind that they deserve this, this healing. They deserve to be whole. They deserve to be well. So, you know, it's just one of those giants that we can conquer from the get go. And they realize that self-care is important. <laughs> it's important. So and the more you do it, the more positive reinforcement you get, right? It's from those little things where all of a sudden you're feeling better and you're thinking, I'm doing that again, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's just stage three in my journey of five. Um, the next stage is uh, revitalized or optimized. Um, and this is where you're starting to feel better. You're kind of in a wellness rhythm 
And uh, now we're going to be troubleshooting other areas of your life. And so that could be sleep, movement, supplements, house detox. So this is not just the foods we eat. This is so much more because we can give you healthy food and teach you all about that. But if you live in a moldy house, how is that going to help you? <laughs> well, <laughs> right. Might help you stay healthier, but it's not <laughs> going to be the health journey you're after. Right. Exactly. So on this healing journey, we talk about all of that, how to improve your sleep, how to, um, uh, introduce more movement. And that does not mean an exercise to an expensive gym, which I don't know if people can get into their gyms nowadays, but um, that's not what I talk about at all. Uh, it's just having more movement to be able to do what we do every day and not get restricted as we age. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash No Labels, No Limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review, and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, Keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.